We'll now just um, uh, charge through uh, charge through 2020 a bit, and, and please, everyone, you're all on mute, which is great. But I, I'd really this is this this is only well, it's much better when you when you when you just don't even stick your hand up, just shout out questions or comments or call bullshit, call bullshit when you think it when you think it's there. You know, it, it doesn't mean to say it isn't. Um, but yeah, I, as I said, I think the more the more kind of Schmidt, questions we can encourage ask, me. Up, yeah. Yes. I said, don't encourage me. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I can see you now. So at least I know when you're trying to talk, I can mute you, Charles. So, you know. Um, so, I mean, 2020 got off to a, a pretty a blinding start, venously at least, despite the, you know, this, this vague threat of some weird disease coming out of China about which we knew very little. You know, Burgundy on Primeur was a huge success. 2018, very, very... Uh, sellable vintage, wonderfully rich, voluminous wines, um, incredible fruit, powerful, very, very sexy vintage, sort of 15, but with more class. Um, and, you know, it was a vintage where I remember saying, um, basically, you know, save up, as in go for the very best wines you can afford, because at their best, these are as good as they get. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people did. So, you know, Burgundy, including a lot of people here, in fact. So, you know, but Burgundy was a very successful campaign. Um, we'll, we'll look back at Burgundy a little bit when we talk about the 19, but certainly, you know, you're, for those of you who, who got involved with Burgundy 18, you've got some amazing wines in the cellar. I mean, it really is, uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's a very, very, very lovable vintage for sure. Um, we then sort of slightly skipped over Barolo 16. We did a, a, a little campaign, but you know, Barolo 16 isn't a campaign that the different growers seem to release at rather odd times. You know, they one does one month and one does the next. And in fact, in some respects, that's a shame because it, it falls in the gaps a bit between Burgundy and Brunello or even Burgundy and Bordeaux. But you know, Barolo 16, if you haven't got a few cases tucked away, you should, because it's an absolutely benchmark vintage for, for Barolo. We're, we're actually intending to buy a bit more and see a few more late releases. Some of them haven't even released yet. So, but, you know, Barolo 16, in fact, I would say 16 generally, uh, not, I mean, trickier for white burgundy, but 16 in Europe as a vintage, you know, anywhere in France, anywhere in Italy, anywhere in Spain, you, uh, in Germany too, Austria, you, you'd be quite hard pushed to get bad wine. So, you know, look out for Barolo 16 if you, uh, if you haven't already. Um, then we did our, we did our last um, IRL in, in real life event in, Charlie, was it end of Feb, early March, the, the Tuscan releases tasting? Uh, yeah, it would. Have, yeah, it would have been. It would have been end of Feb because we had the um, the tasting with Lionel Forey for mid March, which was our first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we yeah. had to move that online, didn't we? We yeah. had to do that online, yeah. Yeah. So again, there were certainly a few of you here this evening there, and that was our last big Honest Grapes event with sort of 60, 70 people in attendance. Um, and that was you know showing off the fifteen vintage in the main, which you know is a great great vintage. Uh, for for Tuscany, um, you know, very good for Brunello, um, probably better than thirteen, you know, the best since ten. Um, although of course uh, we've now got sixteen, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then the you know the the big wine story, the big wine story of twenty twenty, of course, was was Bordeaux nineteen because you know no, no one I think no well no one had any idea what was going to happen. You know, there was every indication it was a very good vintage, but, you know, there's been a lot of good Bordeaux vintages recently. And what was the incentive to buy this year? And uh, again, there was some well, of you more, on our... More importantly, it was, it was whether, whether it was going to come out. <laughs> well, yeah. For, yeah, for about two months, we were like, uh, yeah. no one could get down to, to Bordeaux to taste, to score in May. Um, and the Bordelais were like, we're going to do it next year. We don't know. And so we were all sat there going, right, OK. And then all of a sudden, in about a, literally, it was about a week, they all mm -hmm. sort of went, we're going to go for it. Yeah. <laughs> and we were kind of caught on the hop. Um, yeah. And then, we, we'd, yeah, we'd, we'd, been, we'd been lining up a whole load of Italian merchandise for you. And then suddenly, oh, Bordeaux's live. Go, go, go. So, um, 
but I think it was fascinating. We 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 hosted this um this sort of online Bordeaux summit, which was the first of our big online events. We had about 120 people attending. We had a really good panel. We had Gavin Quinney from Bordeaux, but who also writes the vintage reports for um uh, for Jancis Robinson and for LiveX, etc. We had uh, Rupert Miller uh, from the drinks business, and it was it was Rupert who had said um had mooted will we launch Bordeaux at all this year or will we wait a year and do it when the wines are more mature and better able to taste etc et anyway as Charlie said no come um sort of end of April it was it was all guns blazing and to everyone's tremendous uh, shock and surprise and delight um you know the prices were the best that they've ever been um you know they we I remember um 2008 has always been used as the benchmark for whether or not a burgundy vintage is good value. Now, the thing is, you know, 2008 was a three star, was a, well, well let's say a, a four star vintage at a three star price, if we're being kind, if we're being kind. Um, and, and, you know, normally, uh, Honest Grapes, I think, and other merchants too, frankly, um, you know, you, you with Bordeaux, it's by the, um, the four star vintages at the three star price or the five star vintages at the four star price. But with 19, we had, um, I mean, something that's unique in my 20 year history, we had a five star vintage at a three star price, you know, with discounts anywhere between 15 to 30% on, on previously five star vintages, 18 and 16. So, you know, it was a fill your boots time and people did. So, you know, we, you know Bordeaux was a real success. And I'm sure, I'm sure it was it, at least partly due to the impact of the pandemic. Uh, you'll notice I'm I'm steering clear of talking much about coronavirus because I don't think there's much to add, frankly, that we we need. Oh, well, we to said we wouldn't. About. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. But but you know, I in 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 this respect, not being flippant, but anyone who bought Bordeaux 19 has benefited from the pandemic because I'm sure that the prices would not have been as good as they were had it not been for the underlying conditions that uh, that you know the, the the pandemic basically forced upon the Bordelais. Do, do you um, think there was also some uh, a, a little bit of everyone working from home thinking hmm I've got I've got some time on my hands I might look and read up on Bordeaux and <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not going on holiday. I'm not going on holiday, so, so I, might well spend a few, I might as well spend a few grand on some nice claret. Yeah, probably a bit of that. Um, well, I suppose, is there anyone out there this evening who, I mean, you know, all of you have bought some Bordeaux this year. If you if you did, why? What 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 provoked it? Let us know. Anyone anyone want to leap in? Well, I, I, I convinced my dad to go quite, quite big. Um, <laughs> Which was rather handy for me, but um, I think I think he was just like, look, the the prices are brilliant, and it's sort of, you know, he didn't go big on the bigger names, but it's just more of sort of fill your boots stock that'll last, you know, a good 15, 20 years of of drinking stock out, out of that. So, um, but I was surprised from our our customers. I remember some people who regularly buy a nice amount sort of doubled and occasionally tripled what they normally like to buy in terms of, of, of not only the wines, but the amounts, which was, was surprising. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was um, John. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I had a question. And perhaps you can sort of, as you go through the regions, it'd be interesting to know um, whether you think there are stylistic changes going on. So, one of the things I, I didn't buy any Bordeaux, but I haven't bought Bordeaux for for a while now. But and, uh, but I'm starting to dip back in. To, but as I've dipped back in, what I, you know, I've, so for instance, I, you know, I found um, I bought some 2010, and it's it's monstrous. <laughs> uh, uh, or you know, so every year now with Bordeaux, I'm I'm never quite sure which Bordeaux I'm going to be <laughs> confronted with. Am I going to get a sort of a you know, 15 percent, 15 and a half percent in, in you know, some of the centimillion stuff, or am I going to get something with a bit more acidity or and, and likewise for other regions, they seem to be shifting around quite a bit in style. Mm. Yeah, I think I think it's um, 
I think it's, it's very interesting in, in Bordeaux because you're seeing a, a number of different factors come into play here. Climate change, obviously, you know, uh, vintages which are very solar, like 18, are going to produce wines which, especially on the right bank, you struggle to get much below 14 and a half, frankly. 10 also was, was everyone talks about nine being super ripe and, you know, uh, upfront fruit, but 10, 10, you know, Chateau Lafitte, 2010 is about 14.8 percent you know so um and then you get vintage like 17 where you get you know Pichon Lalonde at 12.8 percent my wine of the vintage in fact and and you're right it's there isn't a um a consistency there so I, I think climate change is one factor also changing of the guard new generation new consultant look at for me, the biggest change in Bordeaux in the last um, three vintages would be uh, Trois Long Mondo. You know, the, it, from 17, 18, and now 19, um, you know, there, there's definitely, there's been a huge change in style. And that has been led by new ownership, new wine consultants, a recognition that they want to de-parkerize, frankly, I think. It's de-pressurize, de-parkerize. So, um, I, you know, the, I, I think with Bordeaux, the, the opportunity now is to be a, a bit more um, disc discriminatory, frankly, in your purchases. So you, you may have loved, I, won't, I was going to say you may have loved Lynch Barge in the 80s and 90s, doesn't mean you will now, but actually that's a terrible example because Lynch Barge is hands down the most consistent chateau I know. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just is, it just is. But, but there are others, you know, that aren't. So, yeah. Buy based on what you like that vintage rather than, um, you know, rather than, you know, who you've always supported. Because I, I do find that it is interesting because I, I, well, I, I'm very much in the camp of, I like the idea that I could drink a whole bottle on my own. Yeah. I'm not saying I would, but, you know, with a meal, I like wines that, you know, if I was in the mood, I'd be, and, and I would be happy with that. Yeah. But boy, you get some bottles now, and, and you have to be sitting down. <laughs> yep, through it, and, and, and not just and not just Bordeaux either. I mean, I've tried no. Burgundies. I've tried Burgundies from eighteen and nineteen, which are fourteen and a half percent. Now, some of them, some of them were good, fourteen and a half percent, because there are some vineyards which can cope with that sort of alcohol. But I mean, by no means all of them. So you know, but Burgundy should not be. A wine that you struggle to finish a bottle uh, on your own or in company or whatever frankly you know so yeah um it's it's all change it's all change um a couple of other things before we move into 2021 um after bordeaux uh, yeah, i suppose the big question is has this is this a reset what will happen with 2020 bordeaux prices you know we we really don't know you know was 19 an aberration will it go back to previous or has 19 set a new a sort of a new price quality uh, point I certainly hope so it'd be great if it is it's good for the consumer it's good for the merchants um, frankly it doesn't do the board lays you know a bad thing to be considered good value so yeah we then had the icons campaign um, lots of great wines for me one of the absolute superstars was the testamata 2018 from BB grapes one of the finest finest Tuscan wines I've tried in, in a decade. Um, and it was interesting because we, we really liked it um, when it had sort of 97 points from James Suckling, but then all of a sudden Decanter came out with a hundred point score. And it was one of, um, it was one of James Anson's only hundred point wines alongside L'Evangile um, um, 19 from earlier in the year. I think she, she gave out maybe three or four or hundred points wines uh, scores and and that was testamata and, yeah and that was a wine at charlie do you remember it was what 360 quid less than that maybe something 360 quid a case of six so it was you know for 100 point wine pretty tasty pretty attractive um and then um after that germany 19 for those of you who haven't bought a case or two you should you know, it's an incredible vintage, Germany 19, some glorious, glorious wines, absolutely lovely. Germany's, it's a bit of a hard sell, or at least it's not, you know, it's not a region where people leap up and down with the same excitement at on premier time, but, you know, great, great wines, great, great value. Some, you can get some incredible, you know, Grosser Gewex 
Grand Cru equivalent Riesling for less than two hundred and fifty pounds a case. You know, so it is, it, it is it, amazingly yeah. good value. It's one of those weird ones that if you're not into Riesling, it's a shame. But if you are, that pound for pound, it really doesn't get much better. And they have had a stonking vintage this year. It has to be said. I think it's going to be. You know, I, I know for us, we always struggle to get a lot of excitement behind it. But for those who who are Riesling fans, there is, you know, not only great value from the from the get go, but actually from um, fr from this vintage in particular. Um, you know, there's some stuff that'll last a good twenty years in there, without a doubt. Yeah. And, and I think once you get in, people get people are super loyal. Once once you're in, you're in. You know, and you're like, oh, I've got to get my cases each year. Sorry, John, you're going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say, are, are you at the trucking end or are you at the sort of more traditional, right across the piece? Totally. I mean, it's, uh, you know, so I, yeah, it, it's, it's very, um, uh, yeah, I'm very ecumenical in my recent years. Although I'd have to say, by and large, I like something with a little, a, a touch of residual, a bit of sweetness, because otherwise I'm like, what's the point? If it's bone dry, then I might as well go Clare Valley or um, you know Central Otago for your Riesling. If it's if it's all petrol from the off and and no elderflower, then I, I you know then I'm just I'm not I'm not so interested. But but it's a great great year. And then a couple of other things that are sort of live-ish. Um, we got our first allocations of Clos Rouge um, last year. Wow. Um, which, which is very exciting, the 2014. And, um, you know, it, it just goes to show, just goes to show that we've gone from having our first ever allocations last year, we now have the biggest allocations in the UK of Clos Rouge in, in, a, in a vintage. And it's amazing that that's coincided with the 2015 vintage, which is just being released. We haven't released it widely yet. We've only offered it to the people who took it last year when, when it was offered. But we have a little bit more this year and you know not only is it the 15 vintage so stunning but it's also the last vintage that the Foucault's made before it was bought um, and before one of them died and one of them retired so it's um you know uh it's got it's got a lot of investment value uh, as well as just being the finest finest Cabernet Franc that you will ever ever drink so you know um it's a proper unicorn wine, uh, Clos Rouge, are. and uh, you know we, we sort of sell it by the bottle. Um, um, but but anyway, we will be yeah, doing an offer. I think it's two hundred pounds per bottle. I think it comes out at. Yeah. So you got to love your Cabernet Franc for that. But it is it is quite exemplary. And actually, the um, talking of the other wine that came out this year that's not going to be out for a while is the the Gaia. Uh, the single. Uh, oh, good point. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the single. Uh, uh, single vineyard, Barbaresco. Single vineyard. Thank you. The Barbaresco's because yeah. I think they. This is they've done the 2016s, but they, they don't think. Well, they pretty much sure they're not going to come out until 2020. I think is their next one. It was the um, 17s. They've done the 17s, but they're not doing another single a single crew from Gaia until the 2020 vintage, which that's right. is yeah. really interesting. But yeah, no. I think we've got um, a little bit of that left as well, but um, we again we got a big allocation and some large formats as well. Five but, liters, five liters, five liters. Of Gaia, a single crew, uh, Barbaresco. Yep. I, and I it's one hundred percent Nebbiolo now. They've yes, that's back right. To Nebbiolo. From the twenty fifteen vintage onwards, that's right. They cut out the Barbera, any any mucking around. So it's now it's now got a it's nice little DOCG label around it too. But yeah, yeah. No. Um. So that was 2020. Uh, uh, just yeah, the, the, the Rhones from 2019, which uh, are a knockout as well. Um, and in the furor of, 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 of all the, the fog of, of everything going on, we've, we've um, been trying to get some, some good allocations. And it is for, for me anyway, I think, I think Northern Rhone in particular is really an area that has just the potential that that's it's kind of you know Bordeaux's been and it's it's hit it's 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 zenith a long time ago. Burgundy's definitely on the ascent and and the Rhone apart from a handfuls of of Gigals, uh, there's the Cote Rotis that are really uh, uh, amazing value for money uh, and glorious if you've got 15 years to, to wait on them. So I know we've done a little bit and I think we're gonna try and pull out a handful more if if we can do. 
Yeah, thank you, Charlie. You're absolutely right. Again, just goes to show, Roan, Roan always, I, I just kind of slightly gets forgotten in the whole, you know, gamut of things. And yet, it's an amazing vintage. Roan 19 is amazing. We, we did a mini campaign, which went very well. And I think we are going to do, as Charlie says, Roan part two with a few producers like um, Claude Caillou and Claude Pap uh, from Chateau Neuf, who made unbelievable wines. Um, I'm, I'm not being cynical, but it did help that Matt Walls um, printed his Roan report for Decanter last week. And a number of producers that we've toyed with doing a bit of an on-premier campaign on all featured in at the very, very top with high 90s scores. So, yeah, we'll, we'll probably have a little dig at Rhone North and South part two. Um, um, yeah, probably. I don't know. De depends which Burgundy growers give us their prices and allocations <laughs> in the next two weeks. <laughs> and, and, and Tom, do you think Cornas can get its act together? <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, under the under the guidance of Vincent Paris, absolutely. I mean, those wines. If you if you haven't seen those wines, team, then then uh, you really should look out for them. Um, Vincent Paris uh, or Paris, you know, however, you have, depends how well you know him, um, is the leading light in Cornas, and um, they're not expensive wines. I think you know his most expensive crew, the uh, Genal, uh, I don't know, two hundred and sixty a case it, they're not expensive and yet they are stunning and i remember back in the day when uh, martin lamb's wonderful restaurant ransom's dock was open down in battersea you know he had a brilliant collection of old vincent paris wines and you know you would pick up these with 20 years age well actually no it closed too long ago so 15 years age say and they were under 60 70 quid a bottle and absolutely stunning so so to answer your question john i think there are a handful of producers who are making corn ass sexy um typically in uh, typically in the uk we've always preferred um crow's hermitage and coat roti if you want to spend a bit more in france um, they love Cornas and they love San Joseph as well, you know, and then Hermitage was just for the sort of uh, the knobs at the top, frankly, you know, who could afford it. So, um, but, but yeah, row, row 19, we really shouldn't overlook. It's naughty of us to do that because there's some, there's some great stuff there and we will be doing a little, a little Rhone offer before the end of the year, I'm sure. So, um, before we sort of charge into 2021, it'll be much shorter 2021 because, you know, I've only got a few things to mention to look out for. I don't want to detract too much from the big campaigns coming up. But any any comments or thoughts on particular wines that you've tried this year from these campaigns or wines you're pleased you bought or things you've missed out on? Any comments about this year? Yes, Tom, we, we, we really actually, one of the best wines we, we tried throughout the year was the, um, and it was a remarkably good value, was this a seller, um, Alimara, the uh, Pinza della Negre. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, I mean, you, you guys are you're doing it at 13 pounds, and that was just an amazing wine for, for, for the money. That's, all, I mean, all sold out, literally all sold out. It's all gone. Because that's... It, well, we got an order in with Charlie anyway. Oh, there you go. Fine. They got a last couple of bit of bottles. But I mean, love I love that the Sal Alamara story. I mean, it's an English winemaker that's that's gone, you know, to Scottish. Uh, Scottish. Scot Scottish. Um, uh, Andrew Ali McLeod. You know? Ali McLeod. Um and uh <laughs> but um yeah, he um I think he went and sort of, you know, hand selected that vineyard for himself, having made wine all around the world. Um, yeah, and, he's, um, and his, his rosé is very good as well. His rosé is excellent. His white as well. His Seigneur, I had it yesterday. I've got another bottle. There's Lumi. Uh, Santa's in the way. There we go. Yeah, Lumi. Uh, but um, the, yeah, I mean, all of his wines are are, are absolutely brilliant. Um, and um, we're lucky enough to get him over. I mean, you may have. May or may not have seen it, but we see he's been over for a couple of weeks in previous years. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is a great find. Who's who's at the back of the cave there? Somebody, somebody's making <laughs> it's our dog. Apologies. Your dog, exactly. oh, yes. miss. Oh, your dog. Chewing on the furniture. Chewing on the furniture, I can tell. <laughs> um, he's found a cork, which is jumping on it. Funny enough, uh, um, 
I, I was uh, I was trying the Lumi Negra today at another tasting in between Burgundy and Brunello for um, which, which it, it, it might become the house red for for quite a prestigious um, uh, um, what can we call them uh, it's, it's Mil just a bunch of people military yeah. establishment or something anyway we can't say any more than that but but anyway so they were very very taken very very taken with the um uh with the uh, um cellar alamara red so so yes it's clearly you're in good company there jeremy good Other, it, otherwise on that john yeah yeah i i well i've got i've got two um etna wines if you get the right ones with some very old vines are you know the the the, the Mascalese. Uh, it can be spectacularly good fun. And the other is um, old quality Moulin Avant. <laughs> Do you know what? Um, That's funny because I remember Nicolas Patel, who's got his Roche de Belen things, and he was sort of, um, I was at a tasting with him, and he sort of came out with a, a range of his older wines, and then also a couple of random bits of 1960s Moulin Avant. And he was saying that, you know, he goes around buying up these old barrels that people have got in their cellars. And he said, I, I bought some straight Village Beaujolais 61 and we were serving it in the vineyards whilst the pickers were going around. And he said, Gamay done properly will knock the socks off people. And, you, and, you know, we all know the story that, you know, they used to be the most expensive vineyards. You, you could buy Grand Cru Montrachet vineyards for, for less than, than, than the prime spots in Beaujolais. Um, not the case anymore, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Gamay, and, and I think it is definitely coming back. I mean, Jane is uh, Jane Eyre is a big believer. She's got some bits that, there, and um, Pacolet's in there Pacolet. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there, there is some extraordinary and, and long lived as well. You know, sixties, nineteen sixties Gamay. You wouldn't really think it was there, but it's it's Pinot. It's fresh. It's light. If it's done properly, it's amazing. I, I, I exactly, John. I when I was I was with Philippe. Pacolet, what three four weeks ago four weeks ago now i suppose and um and you know it you know he made his he made his kind of first impression <clears throat> with the family's moulin avant and i've tried his 1959 and again to charlie's point he tells the story that the previous owners uh Montmassin of claude d'etat they mm -hmm. bought claude d'etat because they couldn't afford land in moulin avant Literally, literally, that's that's no no joke. It was cheaper for them to buy in Maurice Saint Denis Claude d'Etat than it was to buy in Moulin Vent. So totally great. Um, to your point on the um, Nedello Mascalese, well, I mean, Luke, you were out there just earlier this summer with the wonderful Tanuta di Pessina, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I was. Is there actually last year, last May? But oh, uh, yeah, it really... time flies with COVID. Exactly. Yeah, okay. it, it feels like this year, but. Um... Incredible estate, and just just to be up at least halfway up Etna, there you can see the peak with the, with the snow on it in May, and um, those those black volcanic rocks with the hundred year old vines, it's, it's incredible. And some of the wines they some of the mm -hmm. they are making are really fantastic. And like I said, in the Reno Mascalese, it's um, there's a lot of fans these days and a lot of different expressions, but it's yeah, it's awesome. It's de definitely worth exploring. The um, and, and there are some heavyweights that have invested. I mean, Gaia's got a JV yeah. with. Gracchi and um, the guy that was part of the the new you know, the Barolo boys um, that moved down there, um, Marco De Grazzi. Um, yeah, Marco De Grazzi got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they're lovely. They really are lovely. And they they do call it I mean, Nerello Mascalese. For those who are less familiar with that, Etna's wine, you know, it is known as the Barolo of Sicily, um, and it's stunning. So um, Tenuta di Fessina. Who we work with, um, their Musmechi is stunning. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. It's it really is just amazing. Old vine, eighty year old vine, Nello Masculesi. Although John, not being flippant, but you have to be careful with old vines because, uh, quite generally, I, I when I was last in Etna a couple of years ago, there were several old vineyards which were no longer because after the last eruption, uh, they basically they were now under ash. So. <laughs> So yeah, sadly, uh, old vines don't always last. But you know, baked wines. Hmm. Um, so un unless anyone's got any other uh, comments on on twenty twenty wines, then we'll just do a, a quick, a quick chat about twenty twenty ones. Things to look out for. Um, 
address. Yeah, so I'm sorry, quickly on on, on the, the hospice was um, the auction was cancelled. Any, any news on latest on no. that, please? Funnily enough, that that was part of my any other business mentions <laughs> is dun, 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 it's on and it's on this Sunday. So we are bidding this Sunday. It's back. Oh yeah. So it was it was announced by Christie's uh, end of last week uh, that they've rescheduled for Sunday. So uh, it's on this week. Fun enough. We're 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 going to well we were going to send out a little missive to all of our syndicate members to announce the fact uh, tomorrow. Um, but yeah, uh, this sorry for those of you uh, not involved. We um. For the second year running, um, we are bidding on barrels at the Hospice de Bone, the famous Hospice de Bone. Our syndicates are full, so I'm sorry if you wanted to get involved. Too late, you've missed it for this year. But we are um, we're aiming for two barrels of a Premier Cru Poma or Volnay and a single barrel of Premier Cru Mosso. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's going to be quite exciting. Um, it's a great, it's a, it's a very, it's very, very good vintage, you know, 2020 white's going to be amazing, 2020 reds, we've, you know, tasted them when I was out there the other month, um, and, you know, I think we're picking winners, so, yeah, but Graham, it's, it's going on on Sunday, so watch, watch this space, basically. Um, for those who, um, who, those who weren't aware of what we've been up to, although actually I know, you know, Basim's here, um, hang on, who else, who else, who else, wait, 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 uh, oh, John, of course, John's here as well, um, anyone else part of the, uh, 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 Cade is obviously up for this year, but, um, John and Basim were members of the 2019 syndicate, so you all know what we're talking about, but, um, for anyone else who, who hasn't been part of the Hospice previously, this is the, um, the Hospice to Bone, um, syndicate, where you, uh, you, you sign up, you become part of the syndicate, and you get a share of a barrel from the famous uh, hospice. Um, Anna and Jeremy, you've signed up this year as well, I believe. Am I right? We are, yeah. yeah. Will Actually, you make it out in person or, or yeah. are they doing an online um, or it's virtual all online. bidding? It's all yeah. online. They, they, it, it was at the 11th hour that they cancelled the... Um, oh, and Michael as well. Sorry, there you are. Michael, sorry, I can't, can't miss you out as well. We've got a lot of hospice, hospice barrel people, yeah. So... Um, yeah, they, they wanted to do a small event uh, or a small uh, actual t um, uh, auction previously, but then uh, effectively the, the government, the French government, the health authority said no. So now I think it's going to be 100% online um, and with phone bids. So we're doing both. Basically, we've got a, we've got a hotline. We, we've got the, the, the screens going. So um, I'm going to head up to Nathan's uh, on Sunday morning and uh, continue with our, our game plan. It hasn't changed from the last update you got, but yeah, uh, we were going to send everyone an email uh, tomorrow just to let you know that, yeah, it's it's back on and stand by, stand by. Should be very exciting. Hey, hey, Tom, so, so what hey. is the game plan again? Hey, I'm here. <laughs> hey, so what, what's the game plan in terms of uh, what are you, uh, what are we going for? I'm very excited. Yeah. Um, so we are, it's, it's, we are gunning, we're gunning for, um, we're gunning for a Volney a Premier Crew, um, or possibly, possibly uh, a top Pomard Premier Crew. But the, um, you know, basically we, we have two strategies dependent on, on how uh, vigorous the bidding is and what the competition is. So, you know, last year, it was a very, very small vintage, um, or at least there was there was a much smaller amount of wine released by the hospice, and the prices were well. You know, we came in on budget, uh, exactly on budget for the white, and I think eight percent under for the red. This year, there's a bit more wine. There's a there's a there's an extra thirty or forty barrels being released. Also, I think Christie's are, they're not sure about the interest level this year, not least because, you know, quite a few people go specifically for the, the, the fun of being there live. So basically, we, we think we might be able to get a lot of a, a, a particularly great value for our money this year. Um, so the idea, but the idea is, of course, when you look at the, uh, the catalogue, um, the, uh, the barrels come up in a fairly random order. So it, it we, we know we'll we'll get a we'll get a measure of where the market is pretty early on with the early lots, 
and then we will either adopt the strategy of uh, of, of going for um, you know we, we we might try and go big um, and go for the wines which if they were if they were um, at the top of the projected price would be ab above above our budget. Um, however, okay. you know, yeah, if if we're seeing that the market is a bit softer and that people are bidding more in the middle, then you know we can afford to let a few barrels go early on and go for the uh, and go for the kind of the, the the wine which would typically be slightly beyond us if we were at full stretch. So we, we've okay. basically got a two tier strategy. Depend it depends very much on on how the bidding looks early on, and we'll get a good impression of that. Um, quite quickly, um, but it'll be um, it'll be exciting. I mean, the, the great thing is um, we've narrowed our shortlist to uh, what three uh, three or four reds, which I you know which we'll send you again tomorrow, and about three whites. You know, so we'll either get those, and any any of those will be a pleasure and a joy to have, or 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 we won't. <laughs> So, yeah. and, then, and then we just have to refund you we have to refund you basically so you know it is what it is but i think you know we're confident crossing fingers and um it will be it will be a fun sunday okay great well keep us updated and hope for the best very exciting thank you by the way kate you're obviously you've obviously got home either that or you have a very big car <laughs> uh no no I'm, I'm home i made it uh yeah traffic was pretty bad uh on the way out a surprising actually the, the city was dead but uh you know the uh the traffic was pretty uh pretty pretty thick everyone escaping i think yeah. um good stuff okay so so i guess um again any any more um any more uh comments or anything before we talk about 2021 a bit please if, if you do have them just don't don't feel i'm i'm, I'm hurrying you it's just uh, there's other bits and pieces to talk about so yeah, just just pop them in the chat, guys, and then we'll we'll, yeah. we'll come back to them because you know as and when the ideas pop in, do um cool. do do send them. But uh, Tom, I know you're you're gagging at the leash to talk about 2019. So off you go. Um, well, no, actually, I thought we'll 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 come back to 2019 Burgundy. Um, first, I'll just say, um, you know, we 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 are. I mean, if I I've just been in the office with Luke uh, and Red, who are on the call with us today. Uh, trying some of the first 2016 Brunellos, um, which we're sort of starting to offer, but not because we don't want to detract. I, I mean, there's just so many, <laughs> just too many good wines coming out right now that it's it's a bit difficult, especially for, for, for most of us who have sort of wine budgets to think about. But uh, Brunello 16 is, is um, a total benchmark, total benchmark. It, it's the best vintage since 10, you know, it's arguably better than 10, better than 01. It really is, it really is a fantastic vintage. Um, and we've got the 15 reservers too. So look out for that. That'll be super, super exciting. Um, then other things, we've got the completion of uh, Jonathan Malthus's new winery. So for the one, two, three, there's at least uh, four or five um, members of our club Ponte Labri on the call this evening. So uh, those of you uh, who are members of Club Ponte Labri will be updating you about plans to go and visit the winery once it's open. In fact, we'll be planning a big trip for the launch party. Um, uh, so this is um, Jonathan Malthus's amazing new winery in the heart of Saint Emilion. Um, it's right next to Angelouche. Uh, Canon is the other side. Beausseur Beco is around the corner. Beausseur Lagaros as well. And um, Norman Foster has designed, personally designed a new winery and taken an interest in its completion, i.e. has charged about a tenth of what he normally would. Um, and it'll be where Jonathan will move the production of his top wines, including our Ponte Labri too, um, in time for the 2022 reclassification of saint Emilion, uh, which will hopefully see a bit of a, uh, a price rise um, when I say hopefully, it'll it'll mean all the Jonathan Malthus wines you have in your cellar will um, will look cheap by comparison to the new um, the new uh, the new vintages. Uh, Jonathan is very keen that one or other or both of Prince William and Mick Jagger will personally attend and open the new winery. Um, 
you know, he, he thinks he's got inroads, uh, inroads into both. And, and, you know, Jonathan is, you know, a pretty convincing individual. Um, so we'll shall see. So that will be something very exciting uh, for our Club Ponte Library members. And anyone who's not a member and would like details is, is welcome to get in touch. We've just updated the, uh, uh, the brochure. Um, and then um, we're expecting some interesting late release 2008 champagnes. I think there's going to be a couple of very interesting Spanish releases, probably the remainder of the 2018 Chilean uh, wines, also some more 2018 releases from Tuscany, Super Tuscans, and uh, where I think we're back to the first time for a nice cool vintage after 15, very hot, 16, hot, but more balanced, 17, very hot, 18 in Tuscany. Uh, as I said, we, we launched off with the Testamata this year, but I think we'll see some great 2018 Tuscan wines, but a little bit of a cooler vintage, a bit more um, um, focus and precision delineation should be really interesting. Um, and then... I think, um, are we, yeah. I think we finally get the Perse's um, Inseparable uh, landing as well. Um, yeah because we yeah. picked up a lot of that. We tasted a little bit of it. I think we had, for those who were on that yeah. tasting with- um, um, Eddie and David. Yeah, thank you. That, that, was, um, that was quite good. And we have taken a whole chunk, but it's just been held up in, in delivery. Yeah. We were hoping to use it for, for some of our virtual tastings recently, but um, I think those will come online as well. So, um, and uh, give, given the amount that we're backing them i think we'll probably get some nice allocations next year of, of, of uh, their other sort of the top wines because i think um i know you're a big fan tom but i i, I you know I've, I've definitely put some in the cellar as well in terms of nearly 100 point argentine wines that are whatever 60 70 quid a bottle you know pure malbec it's yeah. extraordinary and and made in less than 800 bottle quantities i it's insane so i mean we I got into so much trouble selling cases of six and then they all arrived in cases of four it was the they were cases of four. <laughs> for a long time because yeah. I, I don't have enough i've split it into cases of four yeah. <laughs> don't don't make that mistake again in fact, actually that that was a brilliant tasting with david and, and eddie and i know again there were a number of you on that particular call too i think what was glorious was that whilst it's wonderful to have charlie and, and me uh, well which me particularly obviously wittering away it's so great to be able to do a grower tasting with two such phenomenal winemakers like Eddie and David, who are literally talking from their home in the Uco Valley. And, you know, that's a real treat. And I, I, I was, it was such a successful tasting. And I know that because um, two of the three press guests who joined us shelled out out of their own, you know, our own money to buy cases, in one case, quite a lot of uh, of those wines. So, you know, you know, you've done something well, or you know, the wines are good when the members of the press actually pay for pay for the wines afterwards. But yeah. as Charlie says, yeah, the Inseparable, if you haven't tried it, that's their sort of entre de gam wine. And it's for me, it's I mean, uh, it's just an incredible Malbec, like like no other Malbec that you'll try apart from the other Malbecs from per se. It's just just extraordinary. It's a Malbec for Burgundy lovers, dare I say. It. Yeah, because yeah. it's not it's not a Malbec. Uh, you know, if, if you give it to someone who likes their Malbecs quite chunky and slightly wooded and quite hefty, it's not that at all. It's a real cool climate, really interesting. Um, and it does take a certain explanation to get behind it and say, look, this is not the Malbec that we know. Um, it's probably, if anything, it's, it's closer to the, the cop Malbec of, of Bordeaux that you rarely see any of. Um, you know, the, there's little bits of it left. But yeah, I mean, it's an extraordinary, and, and where they're doing it as well, I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's the edges of, of, of not quite civilization, but they've got a tiny plot. I mean, I remember them showing their pictures and, you know, it, 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 you expect these huge expansive vineyards and it's just a little block around the monastery and it's absolutely extraordinary that they're just so devoted on their little project and yet they make some of the big named Norton Vineyard wines of you know thousands and thousands and thousands of litres and yet they know and, exactly what they want to create. And, and the interesting, uh, I think the interesting thing as well, I, when I said it's the you know, Malbec for Burgundy lovers, I wasn't being wholly facetious because one of the interesting things about the vineyards is they're incredibly 
poor soil which leads straight on to very rich limestone bedrock so you know it, it's not it's not far removed from the sort of terroir uh, the soil at least that you find in the Cote Nui so you know there, there's a comparison John you've unmuted yourself something to, to add oh no hang on on. I think so. I think no I think you're he's actually just frozen I know he's not frozen. just frozen I know John you're back I oh, know okay right sorry um so um um yeah let, let, let's let's return now to to the sort of um topic in hand as it were you know Burgundy 19 uh I, I know a number of you joined for for our little Burgundy um intro the other the other week where I was pretty much reading out my uh, unedited um, Burgundy notes. So sorry, I know it was quite long-winded and stuff. Um, but anyway, those are now all up in a in an edited version on our website as part of our brochure, uh, along with your wish list. Thanks very much to those of you who have already put in uh, your interests or confirmations to various wines. Um, you know, but Burgundy nineteen is a uh, is is a great vintage. I, I kind of get a bit embarrassed saying this about so many regions and so many vintages, but I, I, I am unashamedly in love with Burgundy 19. Um, and I was tasting again this morning, some of the producers I didn't get a chance to try a few weeks ago, including uh, Dugapi, who, you know, Dugapi last year were, were my, uh, my highlight of the vintage. And 19, um, they've, they've, you know, they're, they're really, they're, they are, I can't say they're cresting away because that sounds like they're going to go over the other, <laughs> other edge, but they are definitely, they've never been better. They've never been better. And um, at its, at its best, and there's a lot, of, and when I say at its best, unlike 18, where at its best, you were, where you were best, you were better advised to spend as much as you could on the top wines. Um, there were great wines throughout 18. For me in 19, I found some extraordinary peaks um, at all levels. So even, you know, Edouard Delaunay's Aligotte, frankly, I mean, it's incredible. It's sort of 76 pounds a case of six. It's a, it's a crack. It's a proper white burgundy. It's, a, it's not something you'd ever dream of making a Kia with. It's proper, proper white burgundy. Um, and um, you know, but then of course, at its at its at its sort of zenith, it, it's also bloody good. But yeah, I think um, I think nineteen um, is a vintage that that everyone's going to enjoy. You know, you've got um, at its best um, that you know there's there's a concentration, um, a depth, and a definition, um, which is it, it, hugely impressive. Um, and it, it doesn't have the same, the wines don't tend to have the same volume or density of 18. But, you know, I think there were a lot of comparisons by different growers about what the vintage reminded them of. Um, I Probably the most convincing definitions were somewhere on the lines of, of a cross between 17 and 18. So a bit more oomph, a bit more power, a bit more concentration and length than 17, but the same or approaching the same wonderful terroir definition. Um, and then unquestionably, these are not light wines, there's richness there, but it's intensity, not density. Um, you know, so, so uh, yeah, and, and some of the Lourdes and more junior Premier Cruz for me are what I'll be focusing on because the prices are not going to be doing a, a Bordeaux 2019 style plummet I'm afraid you know they will level peg or be up slightly or possibly fractionally down but you know there's going to be no there's no reason to buy based on price put it that way you know it, it's not going to be a, a vintage like 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 uh, sorry not like like like, like Bordeaux um, but yeah there'll be a lot of fun to be had for sure I'm, I'm happy to give you John, my um, John's got a question yeah, okay, yeah it was just a question. I mean, obviously, the problem with the Cote de Nuit is, um, is, is my friends are not worth the price of it. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, God, yeah, yeah, friends, invite us around. We're happy. We'll upgrade your friends. Community, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to remember, I live in Scotland. <laughs> we'll, we'll travel. We'll travel. There's the day overnight. <laughs> it's fine. But in the, in the Cote de Bonne, because uh, you, you don't, in the reds, I mean, we talk about Côte de Bonne in the whites, but in the Côte de Bonne, 
reds and some of the these other you know sort of slightly lesser villages i don't mean that pejoratively as it sounds but the, there are some interesting things there that are more affordable hmm. oh totally totally um i mean um uh, well one of our favorites you've got de monti's bonne greve yeah. fantastic mm -hmm. i mean what one one thing i sort of suggested i might do this evening um was just pick out a few of my under the radar sort of hidden gems from the 19 vintage. And um, I, I think that, um, you know, there are some fantastic whites there. There's some great Chablis, by the way, some great Chablis in 19 and 20, by the way, 2020 Chablis is incredible, despite this insane heat. Um, but there's some great, great whites. I think that, um, I'll start with the reds because I just remember more highlights. Um, Charles Magnon, Charles Magnon, um, who is you know recommended to us by Pierre de Rocher, um, has has had an incredible year, and his uh, Champerrier, Lourdi Champerrier, is is absolutely fantastic. That's a great great Jeffrey Chamberlain, which should be a premier cru without a doubt. Um, there's a new um, uh, new Von Romane from Claude Franta, who I know, well, Clive, I know you've been supporting Claude Franta for a while. You know, th this is their best year since 15, Clive. Um, and, you know, from the from the Von up to the Echezo, it this is stunning. And the Malcolm Saw is amazing, but they've got a new one. It's not it's not a new vineyard. It's just they now own it. It was part of a, a different. It was it was it was owned by the Bichot family, but under a different domain. But they have a vineyard called um, Les Rouges, which sits just above Echezo, and it's midway in between the price of the village Vaune and the and the Malconsor. And that was phenomenal. That was absolutely brilliant. So that that for me is a, a real kind of ah yeah. If you want a good value, a good value. It's not cheap. But it's it's more in the sort of I think it was more in the uh, 50, 60 quid a bottle rather than Malcolm saw, you know, 80, 90, basically. So it's a it's a good wine. Um, Charlie mentioned one of my all time favorite wines, the Bone, well, all time favorite vineyards is is Bone Greve. So, you know, this is this is a great, great vineyard. And every year as the weather warms up, you know, the slightly less, um, it's not as well positioned as some of the choicer vineyards in the Cote d'Or, but it doesn't need to be. Now you've got all this sunlight, it gets properly ripe. And it's, it's like a mini pomade, but a pomade with a, not just structure, but but class and sophistication. So, you know, the Bourne Greve from De Monti, I, I take it every year and it's never tasted better than the 19. It, it's just a great, great one wine um and it's affordable you know i mean i can afford it i'm a wine merchant so you know um so i would say that's another highlight um i did try some fantastic wines from um delaunay edouard delaunay and i think we launched the offer today um you know um i i was introduced to uh, laurent uh in was it last year yeah last year of course it was last year you know, when he and his wife, um, who have done very well as winemakers with uh, Bade Clemmer, um, they bought back the family uh, estate, or what was left of it, from Cedric Bouchard, um, uh, Brochard, sorry, and um, and they've now, oh, they've they've pulled everything to bear to start making some incredible, incredible wines. The 17s were very good. The 18s were even better. Um, you know, he, he his, his winemaker uh, just won the IWC Winemaker of the Year uh, last week or the week before last. No, last week. Um, they, they were the biggest medal winners from the competition. Doesn't surprise me because, you know, that we tasted a, a comprehensive sort of 28 wines from uh, the domain, right from, as I said, the Aligote at the bottom end, right up to their um, Echezo and uh, Charme Chambata. Phenomenal. And I think a couple to pick out, <coughs> excuse me, from them would be, um, there's the Petit Vougeau, the Petit Vougeau, which is this small little vineyard right on the corner of um, Clos Vougeau. Um, it's got, you've got Clos Vougeau on 
one side. You've got um, uh, Amoroz, probably the most famous um, premier crew in Chambol. And then you've got Musigny Grand Crew um, above it. And it's it's just wonderful. It, it's not a heavy, dense wine like Clos Bougeot can be. It's, it's much more in the kind of Amoroz minerality and the Musigny silkiness. And again, um, it was, I don't know, 300, 300, 360 pounds a case, something like that. So it's it's in the sort of sensible range for a Premier Cruve, and it's really, really good. So that was another proper under the radar little effort. What um, if what if we want to make some investment decisions then rather than drinking decisions? Yeah, yeah. That's Have you got a question. few? Yeah, yeah. Are you yeah, going to yeah, tell yeah, me yeah. I've put them on the list already? Um, well, certainly with the with the with the Dugan Mazzi, yes. <laughs> Don't tell everyone because they'll want Sorry, my case. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You've got my only case, oh, but okay. one of two. So, you know, yeah, um, yeah. Um, no, it's. Um, um, I, I think that I, I think that uh, it's certainly it's certainly worth um, looking at producers like, um, Henri Magnon. I, I do think Henri is, is on, is on the rise for sure. And it's interesting because we're seeing, we're seeing people who typically only buy already existing big names wanting to up their allocations, which is a sure sign that the market is on the move. So, you know, Henri Magnon, you know, Laval Saint-Jacques, um, he's Cazetier. They're the biggest owners of Cazetier in, in, um, uh, in in Jevry Chambata. And Casje is an interesting vineyard because um, it has, although it's a little bit away from, it has exactly the same soil composition as Chambata Grand Cru itself. And and I think, you know, Henri, or well, it's, it's Charles who's taken over from his father, Henri, is making incredible wines. And I and I and I think you're going to see some very big scores from <coughs> from William Kelly. From Neil Martin, from Jasper, you know they're great, great wines. They're they're much more gourmand, um, much more gourmand than the vintage is typically in nineteen. They're richer, um, but they're very, very good. Again, in terms of investment stuff, there's no denying that you know Philippe Pacolet is is on the rise, and you know um, F Philippe is uh, an absolute nightmare, only in as much as you know, they, they, they kind of release whenever they want to. Never particularly concerned about Burgundy on Premier. They just release when they, when they want to. They'll never send samples. So you can only taste at the Maison or if he brings bottles over. But the worst thing is he, he uh, currently they insist on selling in 12s. Uh, so, um, you know, you have to buy 12, which is great because either you do buy or you don't buy, but the wines are expensive. However, he has had an incredible year. So um, if you're starting your Pacolet journey, then actually the um, the La Doie, the La Doie in particular, the La Doie Premier Cru. So these sort of lesser appellations on the fringes, incredible wines. If you've, you know, if you've, if you've got the wherewithal, then, you know, he's Clos Rougeau, he's Echezo, um, the tiny amount of Griot, uh, sorry, Rouchot, Chambertin we get is amazing. And also he's white. He's white, so the best ever I've tried. And, and these wines have huge currency in the Far East, Japan and China. You know, we are very specifically, very specifically not allowed to sell uh, Philippe's wines to uh, clients outside the UK, but, but most specifically not into Asian based clients because, um, you know, the demand is so high there that the agents out there don't have enough wine to sell so they're conscious that other people are constantly sniffing around for um uh, for, for for more so anyway so i, I think pacolet is definitely one one on and the book possibly yeah. hudlo but i don't know how much we're gonna get but, yeah uh, I, th I think that's that's uh, that's got some that's got some cachet for sure um yeah. and then do get a pete as well i mean you tasted them today i don't know whether that'll run true but he's definitely on the yeah. ascendancy oh yeah Good. Duga P, I think, I think were, you know, if you, if you read sort of Decanter and Tim Atkin and Neil Martin, you know, um, and, and um, Alan Meadows, Jasper Morris, I mean, you know, what Loic is doing now at the Domain, um, you know, they are, they are now up there with Russo, you know, they're up there in the top five, they're in the top 
party producers that, that they've regained their former glory. I think I think there was a lot of 100% oaking, a lot of over extraction under his father and the wines. I don't think, you know, everyone knows that Dugapi have probably the best, the greatest terroir, the greatest vineyards sites in Gevry Chambertin. You know, their, their Coeur de Roi, which I tried again today, it's sort of 80, 90 year old vines, it's an incredible parcel. Yes, it's expensive for a, what is a, well, effectively not even a lieu d, but, a, you know, a village every, but it's better than most premier crews and touching most producers, Charme, Chambertin, Grand Cru. So, um, yeah, Dugapi for sure is, is back on both in terms of quality and, and the investment perspective. And then, yeah, I, Tom, do you think Delaunay will, I mean, I know his wines are getting very good, but do you reckon he'll be an investment grade? style or not um yes i do i i i think funny enough we, we've a, a client today uh when we sent the offer out who typically only ever buys only ever buys investment grade wine um said okay come on tom what do you tell me tell me what should i be getting from delaunay blah 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 you know you, you your sales pitch is is convincing enough <laughs> um so away we go so so I, I, I think Delaunay is one to watch. You know, Delaunay for me, look, look at how Olivier Bernstein, Olivier Bernstein, you know, um, became hugely expensive and hugely investable um, in, the, in the vintages sort of, you know, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, Delaunay, Delaunay makes wines which people will sit up and take notice of. You know, and, and getting the accolades that they are in such a short space of time, you know, th these are these are definitely wines to take note of, and and you can get them you can get them now at a sensible price, basically. Tom, Tom, have you tasted the Benjamin Leroux wines? I haven't tried Ben's wines. No, um, not not this year. I'm I um, I'm sure. I will, although since sort of FMV fell apart, I'm not quite sure how they're being represented, possibly berries, I'm not sure. But, but I mean, you know, Ben was another of the early leaders of the micro and the ghost movement, for sure, along with Dominique. And, um, I, you know, it, I, 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 would, I would be very, I would be very um, um, surprised if he hadn't excelled in this vintage, you know. You should try his blendy red. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fun. Yeah. Give that a go. Um, it's certainly, it is definitely a vintage for um, looking at, at regions like uh, Sontenay, Premier Crew, looking at, um, in fact, actually also, I can't not mention um, the Chalonnet. I mean, wow. What's going on in Mercure and Givry? Uh, trying Francois Lump's wines, trying Francois Racquier's wines. If you don't want to spend a lot of money but get a lot of pleasure from your Burgundy, then I mean these are just fantastic. Red and white, red and white, and and they have been an absolute beneficiary of climate change because you know it was always a bit cold and you know it just was a bit cold and grim and grey and you know they didn't. They, they struggle to get consistently ripe fruit. But, you know, now with 80, 90, 20, three very hot, dry vintages, um, the quality of the fruit, the sophistication of the tannins, the ripeness um, is just, they're just brilliant, brilliant wines. And then, you know, you try these and you look at the prices and then you try the Chambon Musigny uh, from the producer next on the table, which is three times the price. And you're like, well, <laughs> screw that. <laughs> You know, it's just, a, it, it, it doesn't make sense. So, you know, definitely the Chalonnay is a great place to look at this year. Um, and yeah, as I said, you know, Marcinet, Sontenay, Oak Coat, Oak Coat de Nuit as well. These higher vineyards, these higher vineyards, which benefit from colder nights. So, you you know, however hot it is in the day, the grapes get to rest a bit. You know, um, 19... Uh, I think 18, 19, well, 19 and 20 have been really good vintages for um, uh, for the kind of the, the hidden terroirs, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the vineyards which aren't as south facing, but, you know, have deeper clay soils, maybe, which are more water retentive or conversely are higher up, 
so are cooler at night. You know, th this the extremes of temperature, funnily enough, mean that the, the wines in the middle, that classic kind of coat door belt of amazing Grand Cru and senior Premier Cru vineyards, uh, unless they're very, very deep rooted and can cling to the water reserves and, and sufficiently low yielding that they don't get hydric stress, they have good canopy management to make sure they're not sunburned, they're struggling. They are struggling. So Tom, do we want to, unless there's more questions, I think we're probably just looking at, at the time in terms of uh, what how we're going to be running. But we've got a frustration with normally with Burgundy on Premier releases that we know that everything is coming and we, we have the time and to, to put together the whole tasting um, repertoire and then also have an offer together. Whereas at the moment we're kind of having to follow the pack and, and we've already released a Monty. Uh, I know that Delaunay is uh, scheduled for in the coming days. Um, out today, today. Went out today. Is it okay? Fine. Um, uh, in, in in between our our numerous uh, tastings, um, and so I think we we've got a plan in terms of we were hoping to obviously do our annual tasting that we do in January at sixty seven. John, are you leaving? Is it a waving goodbye or? Nope, nope. So, hang on, there's a time delay from Scotland. Hang on. <laughs> the sound doesn't travel that fast. You're muted, John. No, you're still on mute. Hmm. There, so, hang on. There yeah. he is. Just send me the date on your tasting. Hopefully, we'll be out of restriction and I can make it. Well, no, well, it, that, it probably won't happen that way. But anyway, we'll send you an email about it. Um, but yes, so. Um, Thank I, you. I think we, we were hoping that possibly on the sort of 12th of January, we'd ho host some form of tasting um, physically, uh, which would, would, would have been the ideal. Um, but given what we've got to work with, that's highly unlikely. Um, and um, o o even if restrictions are lifted, I think we're going to struggle to get everyone to come and, and taste. So we we come upon a, a, an idea and having worked now with these virtual tastings for a little while is to get these sort of sample tubes. Um, it says, oh, there we go. Um, this is an empty one, but uh, what we've decided to come up with is actually working with a, <laughs> working with a producer, it says, because I've got to hold it in front of me, but anyway, 50 okay. CL samples of uh, a variety of different um, burgundies and Tom has worked quite a bit um, and I've had to tame him to a certain degree to just trying to keep it within a frame of, of samples um, to be able to send out but hopefully in the coming uh, week or so we'll send out the options for the sort of three I won't even use three tiers because that's a horrible analogy we have three <laughs> great levels of, of different uh, wines um, in tasting packs and so I'll just sort of give you a cup you know so one of them uh, our first one will have uh, a Premier Cru Chablis, uh, a Merceau from De Monti, a Chassin Montrachet from Philippe Collin and then a Bone Greve from De Monti, a Jane Eyre Chevry Chambertin and a Clos Frontin Louis Saint-Georges but not only um, we, we won't use 2019 um, wines simply because it's too uh, they're, they're, they're too volatile and they just won't travel. So we're, you know, we've got 18, 17, 15, 14 in there. Um, so there'll be a really good opportunity to taste what the wines should be like uh, and possibly, you know, some of the newer wines. We've also got, so we've got three different tasting packs and we'll run those on three different dates uh, throughout January um, to be able to just really show as much as possible um, with, 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 with what we've got really in our favorite producers. Um, and there is, you know, there, there's a sort of top, and these packs shouldn't come in more than, I think we've sort of really tried to keep them at, at cost sort of 40, 60, 70 pounds, depending on um, um, what, what we're working on. I mean, I've had to fight Tom to not put sort of Grand Cru lineups, but there is uh, Frontin's Malkin saw 2011, in there, um, which will be amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, you you forced that one. We we have a Grand Cru too. I, the 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 point is that you know 
the, the only way we can vaguely try to replicate our normal, you know, 70 or 80 wine tasting under the circumstances, we just can't. So these packs, they come from what we call a matrix, where each wine, well, not only will you get the wine, but we will say, look, if you like this wine, but you want to spend a bit less, then here is a wine that you should consider. Or if you like this wine, but you want something which is even better and are happy to spend a bit more, then go this way. So effectively, from the six wines you try, you'll actually have a choice of 18 to, to choose from. And we've deliberately chosen, it has been tough, vintages from individual producers which represent the style of their 19s. The difference being that you get to try the wines with sufficient maturity that you're not doing the tough old job that we have to do of evaluating them when they're quite so young, when they're quite so immature. And, and, and as much as on-premier tastings are very enjoyable, even for the well-knowledgeable, it's quite hard to work your way through, you know, 60, 70, 2019s and assess what is quality. It's great fun and, and we love doing it. I was going to say, this, this lot, this lot, I know they, 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 they give it a go. They give it a very good I know, go. Well, we, we normally have to usher this lot out at the end. Most people have left by this stage. But this is the, it's the faithful few, I think would be the polite word for it. Um, but yeah, um, so no, we're, we're, we're looking forward to that and hopefully um, we should have something up uh on on the on the website relatively soon because yeah. we're looking to host these sort of really early in january i think we've got sort of the 9th and the uh 12th and then and then something a little bit later as well so i've, I've got to, i've got to check dates but you'll see something coming out soon and I, as i said to and i'm going to do a quick follow-up on tonight anyway of just what we've discussed maybe sort of tom's tom's top picks for um for, yeah. for this, uh 2019 as well are you expecting most of the producers to have released by middle of January or will there be a sort of a steady flow after that as well? No, I, I, I'm sure. And I mean, Anna, I think um, some of them have released and that's why that's why we've released the prices. Some of yeah. them are, are hanging on. Um, and, you know, I, I have no doubt all of them, all of them should have released by the beginning of January for sure, because that would be late in the season. You know, we, we normally get all our prices um, in between Christmas and New Year at the latest. Okay. Uh, it's just that happens that a number of them are happy to do so earlier. So, so yeah, I, I'm I'm sure we'll be we'll be all guns blazing in mm -hmm. at early plan. It's just we've started things. The the, the the sort of the the head of the campaign has begun a bit earlier. Um, so you know, but yeah, it, otherwise it'll be business as usual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The format sounds really interesting. So we look forward to that. Yeah, and there's some really good wines in there. I mean, it's been it has been a struggle. Um, it has been a struggle trying to get the right wines, but we have we've got them over, and oh, and now it's just getting them into the flask yeah. and away we go. So you know, we, we'll we'll do our best to recreate, and then hopefully after that, who knows, vaccine a go go, we might yes. be able to start opening things up and doing our our normal our normal events. But you know, um, dose us up. Well, I think yeah. it'd be really helpful. You know, it was hard work getting around all of those wines last year or earlier this year. So um, a narrower field <laughs> would probably make the decision making a bit easier, actually. Yeah, that's that's what we hoped. You know, it was really, um, and, and you know, the, the the wines that we're sending out and then the list that Charlie will send of some of the you know top value picks and stuff. It's the idea is let's try and choose things which are absolutely brilliant and representative of a certain price point from a certain village and a certain crew and a certain producer and then say look we can't give you the four other wines around this but if you like this but you want to spend a bit less try this if you like this but are happy to spend more and want something even better try this and so you know it, it will hopefully you know it'll hopefully allow people to be a bit more informed about their choices during the campaign that's cool great okay team well look were there were there any more questions or comments or uh please if there is do um far far away mm -hmm. i think people i think we're good on yeah. silence Dinner. Yeah, people want dinner. I know I do. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, now, what are you drinking, Tom? What are, what am I drinking? What are you drinking? So I I took back from the office um a bottle no. of the Brunello no, no, Christmas Brunello sixteen. Yeah, and um 
Yeah, I, I would say I was keen to see how it evolved overnight. It's not going to make it overnight. Uh, it's not going to make it over the hour, frankly. Uh, it won't make but it is, Teresa, is Teresa back home? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And we're homeschooling. We're homeschooling. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. I think whilst, whilst we're reminiscing about the wine tech, one of the earliest ones you did was uh, Romitorio. And like that will, will always be a fond memory for me. I thought that was such a fun evening and yeah. it was the whole novelty of doing the virtual tastings. Um, fabulous. Yeah, yeah, it was. That was our first, that was, I think, our, our second or first or second virtual tasting with uh, with Filippo. So, um, and, you know, the, those wines, these 16, Nana, honestly, this, uh, the Brunello and, and the single vineyard, the Filo di Seta are absolutely so uh no, no, no. It's, uh, it's 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 very very good indeed and then Excellent. tom's christmas drinking what are you oh, gonna... God, whatever i i think whatever i'm drinking whatever i've got in my cellar frankly uh, <laughs> i mean and a lot of it magnum <laughs> ideally um sherry i'm gonna bring some sherry I got some sherry. I'm oh! gonna nail that. Yes, I am going to nail some sherry. You know. Thank, thank you again, Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy was the, just the most vocal when we did the fortified tasting the other day, which you <laughs> missed out on. And literally, it was like it was like a three year old being trying to spread broccoli. Is that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, very good. Um, um, so actually, I hadn't tasted it. It was the Bonazo ninety nine. Um, and I'm I'm taking it home for Christmas. That yeah, was epic. I I still got some of that in the fridge from another tasting I did about two weeks ago, and that will last for a while. So yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Sh Shannon is on the menu. For mm, yeah, that one was that amazing. Was David, I think you unmuted yourself, or are you are you? That was only just to say goodbye because ah, I'm gonna. Okay. Well, I wish everyone a very happy Christmas. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Yes, David, you too. Yeah. There's more Madeira where that came from. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's a lovely Madeira. I mean, it because uh, I quite like uh, peated whiskey. Mm. And uh, this 77 has a little hint of peat and smoke at the end mm. and a bit of toffee and peach and things like that at the beginning. So it, it's a wonderful bottle. In fact, given to me because uh, 1977 was the... Uh, my first year in the foreign exchange market. I thought you were going to say it was your birth, your birth year, David. But um, you know, uh... I wish, I wish. No, it's my first year in the foreign exchange market, and uh, oh, I forget how long ago it was. It's not that long ago when Blandy decided that they'd start to do these single vintage Madeiras, um, yeah. and Chris was over in London, and I was invited to. Uh, a small tasting of Madeira because I used to go out there a fair bit because I do like Madeira and port. Um, but Madeira, I have a particular uh, love of because uh, a Frenchman once had to treat me to an 1815 when he lost a very silly bet with me. Um, but uh, wonderful place to go and taste Madeira. Yeah. So when they started coming out with these single vintages. I was very keen to get a few in just to see what it was all about. And this, this 77 is absolutely awesome. It's the nicest one I've got, actually. It's um, no, actually, David, I mean, I, I think for, for, for value and longevity, you, you cannot beat Madeira. I mean, forget port, forget sherry. It, it's just extraordinary. You know? And you can pick up not maybe not your 1815, but you can pick up bottles from the 1860s for less than 200 quid a bottle if you're if you're sad. So, you know, it's they last ever. I remember, you know, Michael, it was Michael Broadbent, dearly departed. His favorite, his favorite tipple was Madeira, would always have a bottle of Tarantes or, or maybe a Malmsey for something a bit richer on the table at Christie's in his office. And they're amazing, amazing wines. Um, so good for you. Yeah, very Christmasy too. Absolutely. And that's why I thought I'd bring it as we were in the yuletide season <laughs> thank you well very nice to see you all. also um michael michael birch as well um lovely to see you for the first time on one of uh, on one of these calls nice as well. here. sorry we uh, we ducked out because we had a bit of dinner but yeah looking forward to it and uh, okay. yeah just going back to one of the early comments about bard on 19 i went uh, i went a bit nuts actually because i could see the prices coming down and the uh, and that's unfortunately, Tom, we hadn't met by then, else um, things might, <laughs> you may have had a better year, but yeah. 
Oh, well. thanks, thanks to Tim at Sorrels, I'm pretty well stocked now. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Michael, it's very good to have you on board. It's um, lovely to see you all this evening. Thank you for joining us. I'll go and let you all go and grab your dinners if you haven't already. Um, keep in touch, as you will, I know. Um, we'll let you know all the funds and uh, ins and outs going on. Um, for the hospice members, um, yeah, stand by. We'll give you updates of what's going on. And away we go. So thanks very much, Gene. Cheers. Thanks.